Oha. Please kokua and help us reach new viewers by subscribing to our HUOA YouTube page. Look for the red subscribe button on the bottom right. It's free. Your subscription supports our mission to share Uchinanchu Aloha around the world. Also, don't forget to give our videos a thumbs up. Mahalo and yuta surugutu urige sabida. Hey, Pat. Hey, David. How are you guys going on, sir? How are you? Very good. Thank you. Excited to see you on a Wednesday evening. It's been, I feel like I've been seeing you uh, quite often this past I know. Uh, Last three to week, four weeks. This right? week, over the weekend. <laughs> it's been a busy, well, September, for those of you who know us, uh, may know or may or may not know, uh, September is a busy, busy part of the year for, for HUOA. We just had our, our virtual Okinawa Festival earlier in the month. Mm -hmm. uh, and then we also had the 70th anniversary we just celebrated uh, two weeks ago, or maybe it's last week. It's yeah, so blend I, already. I, I know you guys, all the ones that did video editing, like yourself, David, you guys did a super job of editing. And I know it, it, it's tiring because it's, it's a lot of work. And I want to thank you, Jacob, John, and Chris, and everybody that, 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 that helped. It, it's just so wonderful to see that you guys did a program and it went off very nicely. So thank you. Yeah, and, and, you know, actually, you know, it takes a whole village because, uh, you know, of course, we had the video editing crew, but you know, there's a lot of thought and is put into from the committee members to, to put the programming and what the, uh, you know, reaching out to the club membership to get videos. So, so yeah, yes. yeah, it was yeah. very, a lot of fun for us. So, yeah. you know, real quick, I just wanted to say hello to everybody out there. Uh, feel free to let us know, you know, where you're tuning in from. And, you know, we would appreciate if you could support us. I think we're just so well over 3,000. Uh, followers but uh, if you can hit the subscribe button this, if you're on YouTube it's on the bottom right hand side there's no cost to it but it does help support and help us uh, spread our message better and so that would be a big uh, 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 appreciation and then uh, you know if you're able to we would always uh, uh, you know love to have uh, if you enjoy what we're what we're putting out we, we try to uh, 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 put out as much video content as we were able to and so if you go to our HOA uh, YouTube page, you'll actually find over 100 videos and Yuntaku episodes, all the Yuntaku episodes. It's like DVR, so it's, it's, it's play on demand. So even like the 70th anniversary that just uh, aired, if you missed it, it's a two hour long programming packed full of club histories and, and HOA histories. And even tonight's program is going to be very special. So, uh, you know, if you enjoy all the video content that we're putting out, and support our mission we would love to have your donation so you can actually go to the description below and uh, find uh, uh, our link to our our web page and there's a big donate button at the top right and we would very much appreciate it yeah just on top of that too so you know i i was, I was looking at tonight's program and i'm and i was thinking well you know i should call all my family and friends and tell them <laughs> to watch tonight's program so i'm imploring all of you that are watching right now to actually really call your family and friends and tell them this tonight's program is really special. It goes back uh, 20 years ago to showcase the 50th anniversary of what we did, uh, you know, 20 years ago. And there's a lot of history involved. And I think people are going to really enjoy tonight's program. We're not going to do much talking. You're going to be watching the video for like 42 minutes. And uh, after that, we'll, we'll, we'll come on and kind of like mention something. But um, anyway, uh, I can start the program. You want me to well, go? Well, <laughs> actually, you know, I'll do a quick update. Uh, many okay. of you, again, if you haven't, uh, if you don't receive this Purple Blast, uh, let us know. Uh, just email the uh, uh, info at hoa.org. We send this out pretty much uh, once a week. And it just lets you know what the Hawaii Okinawa Committee, well, HOA and the Hawaii Okinawa Committee is, is up to and doing. And so it's one way to kind of find out. And then if you want to get involved, you can find out what's going on too. But of course, this Yuntaku Live, uh, 50 years of hearts together, uh, will be featuring, they are featuring right now. But we also have uh, information on the World Youth Uchinanchu Association. It's a uh, network of young Uchinanchus who've uh, kind of networked uh, from around the world and they, they always they have a pretty good uh, social media group and, and network put together mm -hmm. to keep uh, 
us tie together globally and and see what the different uchina juice from the around the world are doing and this is perfect uh chance to get involved with them because we have the uchina you know he coming up uh next month in october where we get to see uh what the uchina juice around the world are doing and then not only that that we have the the uchina taikai uh coming up uh, next year so it's a uh, one way that we get to actually connect and see each other hopefully physically so um also we have the give aloha to support hawaii program this is uh, where you shop at food land and in, if you could give uh you know if you're shopping there anyway there's no cost but uh, if you do share our organization that uh, you're rep- you're supporting uh hawaii united okinawa association you can give this code or just say hoa and they'll donate a portion of your food purchases to HOA. And then last but not least, we also have a survey. You know, many of you uh, were able to watch the Virtual Okinawa Festival. We had over 48,000 views on YouTube and Facebook. And thank you very much to you and around the world. Uh, we also um, were able to reach over, uh, according to KHON, over 300,000 people. Um, through uh, Katie and Cho and through the, the week of programming that we've had, we, there's about 10 different shows. And so a uh, huge reach. We would love to hear your thoughts uh, on uh, what you liked, what you didn't like, uh, your suggestions. So you can go here and take the survey. And all of this is also available on the HOA website. Good information, David. Thank you. And, you know, again, the 70th was uh, this just past week. But, you know, if you missed it, um, you can go to uh, HEOA. Just go to YouTube and go to HEOA. Web, uh, just search HEOA in YouTube and then go to the HEOA channel. And then from there, you can find the, uh, the 70th anniversary programming. It's a great programming. Mm-hmm. I, I, Pat actually has, uh, has a quick message about the 70th. Yeah, so anyway, um, for those of you that <clears throat> don't know who I am, I, I, I am Pat Miyashiro, the HOA 2021 president. So uh, I, I just want to say thank you to all of you that purchased and picked up our Tasty Bento to help us celebrate our 70th anniversary last week in the in virtual program. And we hope you enjoyed it. Also, a shout out. Thank you to our committee members, especially chaired by Gail Watanabe and Cheryl Tanaka of Pushichang Club. The planning committee did a lot of preparation and planning for the bento sales and pickup, the programming, getting club videos and editing, and lastly, getting the clubs to to turn in their club displays for an all in 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 person viewing at at the at the Okinawa Center in the Chaya when the COVID pandemic subsides and we can meet in person. So we're hoping for that. So tonight's program is will take us down memory lane. And I think uh, it'll, it'll showcase what happened 20 years ago during our 50th anniversary. So it's kind of like a combination tonight is like a, 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 a prelude, not a prelude, but uh, uh, afterthought of what happened uh, uh, when we did the 70th anniversary. So it's a continuation of last week's program, I think. And um, <clears throat> anyway, what, what is what is really unique is that the fact that 20 years ago, James D. Hill was a president and his theme was Yui no Kukuru. And in, in English, it means Uchina spirit with hearts together. And my theme is Chimagu Kurutichi, All Hearts United as One. And it's basically the same thing. So the thinking is the same 20 years ago. So I just want to say that uh, we Okinawans try to work together, but we don't know that we're working together, but we have the same kind of thinking and it goes on. Uh, it goes on in our you know type of work. So I hope you guys enjoy the program and maybe David and I will make some comments at the end, but you know, tonight's program is really interesting. So I encourage all of you to call your family and friends to, to watch tonight's program. And, and, and those of you that, can help your grandma, or grandpa, get on the get on the get on the computer, help them, because uh, I think they're going to enjoy the program. So, yeah, and, and you know, just a little bit more about the uh, programming <laughs> tonight. So, uh, this this video, this 50th uh, anniversary video of HOA, was upon a collaboration of HOA leaders, volunteers, Hawaii Okinawa TV, and JM Productions. The video is titled 50 Years of Hearts Together, 
It was shown to attendees at the HOA's 50th anniversary celebration on September 22, 2001. So, so many of you, probably including myself, probably have never seen this uh, video if you, you know, didn't have a chance to attend. The video covers the first 50 years of HOA history with video footages never seen before by many HOA members. It includes interviews with past leaders, including Shinsuke Nakamine, Akira Sakima, Seiyang Se Hokama, Roy Kaneshiro and Ken Kiabu, along with recent leaders Ed Kuba, Maurice Yamasato, Jane Serikaku, and Alison Yanagi. So the video reflects the growth of HEOA over the first 50 years. I'm very excited, Pat. Yeah, so am I. I, I, I just watched a little clip of it that you showed me and said, oh, that, <clears throat> that, that, that don't look familiar, but I know some of the faces. And unfortunately, you know, for those of you that are watching, half of these people are not with us today, but uh, it brings a lot of memories that uh, this is what they did in the past, and uh, it shows the spirit still lives on in in in, in today's Uchinanchu people. So, yeah, definitely. And then before I start, I just want to do a quick shout out to Karen Takara. Thank you very much for joining us. And then Gwen Fujia says Kailua in the house, and also Minami no Shima. From hello, I'm watching from Haisai, Okinawa, and and uh, let she was saying, uh, or she or he is saying, a little wind is blowing in Okinawa because of Typhoon Glaze. So, hopefully, everybody stays safe over there. But again, um, mm. without further ado, uh, 50 years of hearts together celebrating the 50 years of HEOA 50th yeah, going down memory lane, memory lane, going down memory lane. Okay, yeah. everybody, please enjoy. April 1945, the U.S. Army showers Okinawa and its neighboring islands with bombs. American soldiers hit the shores of the islands, hunting down Japanese soldiers hiding out in caves and in the homes of innocent Okinawan civilians. Many residents escaped to the north, taking shelter in caves, scavenging for food at night. When the fighting ended in June of 1945, more than 120,000 Okinawans lay dead. Others starved to death or died of illness. Okinawa was in shambles. In Hawaii, information on the conditions in Okinawa was limited to newspaper reports. Well, when Taro Higa, a local Nisei, came back and told us what really happened in Okinawa, no food, no shelter, they needed help. So this is when some community leaders started to gather clothing and uh, pharmaceuticals, so we all got together and we put up a tent and we gathered clothes and we shipped clothes from Camp Port Road. First it was at Jikoen, but it got too small. Jikoen Temple was the setting for many Okinawan community efforts, including the one that would forever bond the two island communities of Uchinanchu. Well, about 150 volunteers every day, you know. We get to, uh, some people, they get pick up our clothes and, you know, shoes, whatever, they donate the Purugine, and some amending and sorting and something. In the meantime, we have to donate, get a donation for the luncheon for 150 people every single day, about three weeks. According to Shinsuke Nakamine, volunteers at Jikuen filled 1,350 casket-sized cases with clothing, shoes, medical and school supplies, and other basic necessities to help their Uchinanchu cousins through their bleakest hour. Maui volunteers gathered in 1945 to collect and pack clothing for war-torn Okinawa. By February 1946, 
151 tons of clothing had been collected throughout the territory and shipped to Okinawa. The U.S. Navy pitched in and transported the goods to Okinawa. But Okinawa was also in dire need of food. The war had claimed not only human lives, but thriving vegetable patches and livestock as well. When word of the situation in Okinawa reached the ears of Hawaii Uchinanchu and other compassionate non-Okinawans, the two joined forces to raise money to buy livestock, pigs and milking goats, to send to Okinawa. They knew the animals would reproduce and continue to be a source of livelihood for the people. The mothers needed milk for their babies. At that time, food wasn't that plentiful. And this is why they wanted to have milk goats, the milk for the mothers to feed the babies. In 1948, seven Hawaii Uchinanchu men sailed to Oregon to take possession of 550 pigs they had purchased with donations from the community. From Oregon, they sailed to Okinawa battling rough seas. A year later, 10 Hawaii men sailed for San Francisco in two groups to pick up a total of 700 milking goats and accompany them to Okinawa aboard a military chartered ship. Akira Sakima was asked to join the second group. We had to milk the goats twice a day because if you don't milk it twice a day, the goats get fever and they become sick. And the ocean was rough and most of us were sick, especially me. I had to hug the goats and milk with one hand because it was so rough and I, I can't take the ocean. And when we reached Okinawa, which was about 12 days, we were so happy to see the Okinawans on the pier waiting for us. And you saw people walking around with uh, baskets on their head, the women. So really, your heart goes out to them. The army unloaded the goats and handled their distribution to the civilian population. But the work was only beginning for Akira Sakima. Before leaving Hawaii, he had collected some cash, dollars that Hawaii Uchinanchu had dropped off at his Kalihi Valley home. None of them gave, gave money for their relatives in Japan. And when I mean money, not $10, $20, it was $2, $3, $5. And even at that, I had about $2,000 in money to give to relatives. They knew that their relatives were in need. So they said, please, if, if you give it to them when you see them. So I made every effort. That one mission to Okinawa changed Akira Sakima's life forever. Up to that point, only is what we heard from our mothers and our fathers. But when I went there and I saw how they lived and who they were, the relatives and so forth, I, my interest became greater, you know. It's after that, I think, that my feeling for Okinawa changed. Hey, that's part of us there. Nearly four decades later, when the United Okinawan Association embarked on its fundraising campaign to build the Hawaii Okinawa Center, Sakima was asked to go to Okinawa to seek support from the people. People about our age of that time, which was about 60 years old, 65, they say, we can't forget your people. So they were now, at that point, they were uh, middle management or executive. So they donated. They told me, yeah, we want to donate because you folks helped us when we really needed help. It really brought tears to our eyes. The end of World War II left Okinawa under U.S. occupation and jurisdiction. Committed to continue aiding their cousins in Uchina, many Hawaii Issei and Kibe Nisei began talking about forming an organization of Okinawans that could work with the American government while also bringing together Okinawans in Hawaii. Not as people from one area of Okinawa, but from all over Uchina. The task was a big one. There had been several attempts to establish an Okinawan organization, but all were short-lived, oftentimes hampered by their differences. Until September 1951, when Issei and Kibe Nisei, like Kamesuke Nakamura and other Uchinanchu, decided it was time to get serious with the establishment of the Hawaii Okinawa Kenjin Dengokai, the United Okinawan Association of Hawaii, made up of 14 member groups. We need the Okinawa people. We have to have so everybody hard together. We build up uh, with the uh, Nakatakiba. 
Yeah. Everyone together. We need. They all time they fight. They work together. Oh, okay. yeah. I was the one that stopped the fighting all the time. Oh. If you follow all the time like this, yeah? Yeah, yeah. okay, people, they work together. Yeah. I asked them, you want do, we do again like you follow? He said, they said, no. Well, we do, we think about make Okinawa okay, group together. So, so, we start Sojinkai. Yeah, yeah. Well, Sojinkai. Yeah. So, and then, Sojinkai people pick up one and join to the UOA. Yeah. See? Hey, no more, no more higher than everybody equal. The member clubs tended to the needs of people who had come from the same town and village in Okinawa, enjoying the fellowship of Shimanchu at yearly New Year's Shinnan Enkai and summer picnics. And in times of need and sorrow, members supported and assisted each other. The establishment of the United Okinawan Association had its benefits for the clubs. Information coming from Okinawa went directly to the UOA. If you have uh, joined the UOA, then easier to contact Okinawa too, see, through the organization. That's a more like official, you see. In the aftermath of the war and during a period of American occupation directed by USCAR, the U.S. Civil Administration of the UQ Islands, concern for the welfare of their families in Okinawa by a strong organization made up of Americans of Okinawan ancestry made a united Okinawan association all the more vital. But Nakamine says the organizers of the United Okinawan Association never in their wildest dreams imagined that the organization would ever be as large or as active as is today's HUOA. The UOA made the move early to conduct its meetings in English rather than Japanese, which helped draw in young Nisei and Sansei. With USCAR funding, many Okinawans were able to come to Hawaii and the mainland United States on a national leadership program to attend American colleges and universities, to observe American business, and even to gain hands-on experience in farming and fishing. And whenever they passed through Hawaii, no matter what hour of the day, representatives of UOA were always there to greet their fellow Uchinanchu. So we taking care of all those people, you see. Even myself, my uh, memory, correct. over 3,000 people we took care of. And those days all use uh, he can be a base, not a civil advance. So we have to midnight, 12 o'clock, we wake up and meet them, pick them up, and take to Waikiki Hotel, you know, and then the morning, we get up early. And then, uh, we take them all to the tour and uh, like that. In the evening, we have a, uh, evening, we have a, uh, nani. Party, eh? UOA member clubs were notified whenever Okinawans from the same hometown or village of their Issei would be in Honolulu. Many attended welcome parties organized by the UOA. As an organization, the UOA always looked out for the welfare of Uchina's people. For that, Nakamine says Okinawa was always grateful. Oh, yes. They always said that without the UOA, how to, you know, communicate that any people outside and especially Hawaii. They most felt the appreciation after war relief, eh? Deconstruction period, they helped so much. Not the financially, but the spiritually. Warren Higa saw death and destruction in Okinawa firsthand. As an American soldier who was part of the U.S. forces that went ashore on Okinawa on April 1st, 1945. In 1961-62, during his term as president of the United Okinawan Association, Warren Higa found himself in a position to help Okinawans get back on their feet, thanks to programs funded by USCAR. Bringing over farmers, young farmers, to learn how to do vegetable farming, poultry, piggery, not cane field or pineapple now, just individual farming type. As the years progressed, more and more clubs saw the benefit of joining the United Okinawan Association. The UOA kept the member clubs informed through several means, through mailed correspondence and through the media. USCAR also sent Okinawan students to the University of Hawaii to learn English and their own area of study. 
Okinawans in Hawaii try to represent America in the best light, eh? and try to encourage them, use the American resources while the Americans are there. And that, to me, was the most important um, message that we could probably give to Okinawans there. Take advantage of their presence there. But the United Okinawan Association did not exist to serve only the people from Okinawa. Its focus was also the home front, Hawaii. In 1957-58, the UOA introduced a college graduate's testimonial dinner. We sponsor every June graduation night for college graduates, University of Hawaii, and from those from the mainland. Honor them and their parents at this function at one YMCA. When they uh, announce the name of the graduate, they call the name, they call up the parents and doko doko son. So the parents were so proud and happy to be recognized. To me, that was our biggest contribution toward education in my system. In time, conditions began to improve in Okinawa, which remained under U.S. occupation. Naha City, which had been obliterated in the Battle of Okinawa, underwent massive reconstruction. Throughout this period, the UOA leaders were invited to visit Okinawa on friendship missions. In 1964, UOA President Seiyan Hokama received an invitation to visit Okinawa. There, he met with Chief Executive Seiho Matsuoka, USCAR appointed leader of the Okinawan civilian population. So I requested some kind of gift for Hawaii's uh, Okinawa, 80 years old peoples. So, so called, we had a Bonin Kai and Keiro Kai, the owner in the elders. So we had, I had a 300 gift from uh, Mr. Matsuoka. So we really enjoyed it. In the years that followed, the nature of relations between Hawaii and Okinawa transitioned from relief assistance to Okinawa to expressions of love through Okinawan culture. The culture of Okinawa was highlighted in cultural jubilees sponsored by the UOA. Okinawa supported the effort by sending many of its dance masters to Hawaii to perform in music and dance programs for their Hawaii cousins. The 1970s was highlighted by Okinawa's reversion to governance by Japan and continued development. On the home front, the UOA continued to grow. 1980 marked a major turning point in the history of the United Okinawan Association, when close to 40 Sansei Okinawans were invited to visit their ancestral homeland by Governor Junji Nishime. When cultural historians look back on the history of the UOA, this two-week visit to Okinawa could stand out as the catalyst for today's Hawaii United Okinawa Association. For young Okinawans like Ken Kiabu, who the following year became the first sansei to serve as president of the organization, the journey to Okinawa ignited the kind of energy, excitement, and enthusiasm that continues to bear fruit even today, two decades later. A lot of the members came back so motivated, and, and they got involved in their own Sonjin Kai's, they got involved in the UOA. I, I think this was really the start of the UOA blossoming, because as we started with, with all this enthusiasm, they um, got their friends involved, and so we got more people involved, and so I think the, the group, the, the circle got larger, and, and th this is why I think the, the UOA burst into the community. I mean, um, the Nisei's worked hard, and then I think it, 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 it things just kind of stay status quo for a while, and then after this trip, we got rejuvenated, like, and so uh, things changed, and, and, and bringing all this young, new blood in, I think, really helped the organization. The key to UOA was turning over leadership to the younger guys. Um, I think that's the biggest step they could have done to expand the organization. And it all began with that trip. Not all of the young people were initially thrilled about going on the trip, recalls 1981 UOA president Ken Kiabu. For a few, their parents or their son Jinkai had submitted their name, and they were selected. But as the trip progressed, as they learned about how Okinawa had come to be, about its history, its economy, its culture, as the warm smiles and generosity of Okinawa's people began to penetrate their hearts, as they walked the land that had once been home to their own grandparents, something began to change. 
For about three days, we all had to go to our own families and, and, and live with them. And most of us didn't speak Japanese or didn't know much Japanese. And so they were very apprehensive about going and staying with their relatives, and even I was, because couldn't speak Japanese. But after the third day, when they came back um, in the hotel, you couldn't stop them from talking. Uh, and they came back with so much omiyage. But I don't think just the omiyage was a, the thing was that they got to meet their relatives, they ate the food, um, they learned about their, their, their roots, and they came back so enthusiastic. I mean, uh, it was like night and day. When Ken Kiabu was installed as the UOA's 1981-82 president, his fellow officers were all sansei, who had just a few months earlier been part of that first leadership group to visit Okinawa. We uh, started the, the Uchinanchu paper. We thought that we need to get this, some kind of a newsletter out so that we can inform the members. And uh, the Hue Makaala used to have their you know, softball games and stuff, and that kind of dwindled down. And so we started to revive the sports program, like uh, softball and volleyball and stuff. The level of enthusiasm was simply amazing. From that trip was born the young Okinawans of Hawaii, who brought to the United Okinawan Association new ideas and perspectives, tremendous energy, and a new commitment to ensuring that the cultural heritage of the Okinawan people would live on. Today, one of the most visible expressions of Uchinanchu pride is the Okinawan Festival, an event that was inspired by that 1980 trip to Okinawa by Hawaii Sansei. UOA President Roy Kaneshiro saw the festival as a way of bringing together all of the UOA member clubs. Like anything new and untested, some people were initially apprehensive. But you know, once we felt that you know, we, we decided that we're going with the festival and everybody just pitched in and worked really hard to make it a success. Stanley Takamine, who had served as 1979-80 UOA president, agreed to chair the event which, in its own humble way, said so much about the beauty of the Okinawan spirit and of the value of working together. Kaneshiro says the first Okinawan festival was more than just an attempt to replicate an event held in Okinawa. It was the result of the encouragement of the Issei and Nisei generation and the leadership of the UOA, who gave the 1980 group the opportunity to retrace the steps of the immigrant pioneers. As the Okinawan festival unfolds each year, Roy Kaneshiro remembers one moment in September 1982 that made all the anxiety and hard work worthwhile. This elderly Issei, and she came up to us and she had told us, you know, um, you know, at this point in her life, you know, being kind of old and, you know, not in really good health, she knew, you know, she could never go back to Okinawa. So to see something like this, you know, in Hawaii, um, you know, she, she, she was really happy. You know, the fir first festival, you know, like being you know, at, at Makui Pavilion, you know, it, it, it seems so small compared to, you know, today's one at, you know, um, Kapilani Park. And I, I don't think, you know, any of us really realize, you know, that it would have grown, you know, to this proportion. But, you know, I think all of us, you know, who were involved in the first festival, you know, feel really feel good about the whole thing, you know, how it's grown and how, it's, how important it's become, you know, to the community. For Roy Kaneshiro's father, Akibe Nisei, seeing his son get involved in the Uchinanchu community was like watching him being reborn. Before that, only just I'm Okinawa. That's all, mostly Okinawa, about Okinawa, he don't know. Yeah. After that, he, the president, all people together, as I, he know, he find out Okinawa is that good and uh, my grandfather them he came to Hawaii he worked hard I mean one of the most important things is that people um, they're not ashamed to say I'm Okinawan even the young uh, people now I, I listen to them when you ask them what are you they don't just say I'm Japanese they say I'm Okinawan of course first we're Americans but I think also the older you know the Niseis and some of the Iseis they were I think after all they didn't want to say that they were Okinawan. But now I think everybody's proudly walked to say I'm Okinawan. The only missing element in this emergence of Uchinanchu pride and community-wide involvement through the UOA was a place the community could really call home. For decades, the Okinawa Memorial Hall at the Jikoen Honganji Temple 
had served as a gathering place for Hawaii's Uchinanchu. But the community had grown by leaps and bounds. The dream of building an Okinawan cultural center had been a dream for many years, at least from the late 1970s, when then-Governor Junji Nishime stopped in Hawaii on his way back to Okinawa from South America. Why, he asked, did Hawaii not have a cultural center? After all, the first Okinawan immigrants had settled in Hawaii. So in the early 1980s, Uchinanchu architect Maurice Yamasato was asked to come up with plans for an Okinawan cultural center. He met with several community leaders, among them Peter Iha, Albert Teruya, and Stanley Takamine, to assess the community's needs. From those discussions came Yamasato's first plans for a center. But the plans for a center never went beyond the drawing board. In 1985 or thereabouts, I went to Okinawa and I visited um, certain of our friends in Okinawan government officials. And again, I mentioned the idea of an o Okinawan center here in Hawaii. Our closest friend in Okinawa at the time, Kamesuke Nakamura, longtime president for the Hawaii Club in Okinawa, said, hey, you guys come over here year after year and you're talking about building a center. Nothing happens. The people here in Okinawa are starting to think that you folks are all mouth, no action. And that shocked me. Kuba came back to Hawaii and began talking with Stan Takamine and Gary Mijo, who agreed to co-chair the project. Maurice Yamasato's drawings were rolled out on the table again, and George Uema began working on the center's design and construction. When Edward Kuba's term as UOA president ended in 1987, he turned right around and assumed the role of fundraising chair. On March 16, 1989, the United Okinawan Association broke ground on the two and one half acre parcel on which the Hawaii Okinawa Center today stands. There was no turning back now on the dream for a home that would honor the sacrifices and fortitude of the Okinawan Ise. January 7, 1990. In Hawaii, the Okinawan community opened the celebration marking the 90th anniversary of Okinawan immigration to Hawaii by honoring their past. Ninety years earlier, 26 immigrants had come ashore in this new land after nearly 10 days at sea. Tens of thousands of immigrants from the islands of Okinawa followed in their footsteps. Life was harsh and oftentimes so lonely, but they sacrificed and persevered. In the rich, warm soil of Hawaii, they planted sugarcane and new family roots. From the get-go, the year 1990 had been targeted as the year the doors to the Hawaii Okinawa Center would open to the community. Until that day, they worked at a feverish pace. In Hawaii, the center was seen as a magnet for not just the Okinawan community, but as a much-needed facility that was welcomed in the Gentry Waipio area. The icing on the cake was the commitment of Hawaii's first lady at the time, Lynn Kobashigawa Waihe'e, a sansei of Okinawan ancestry, to serve as honorary chair of the project. Our small group of half, of half a dozen people grew to 10, 15, 20, up until uh, we got about 500 people involved. The timing of the center was perfect in a lot of respects. The, um, the center was built in memory of the Iseis. And the Niseis had the money, the sanseis had the organizational skills. So the Niseis and the Sanseis together with the money and the, um, the expertise needed for the center built something in memory of uh, their ancestors, the Iseis. Kuba says the Okinawan community was strong. After some five years of having organized highly successful Okinawan festivals, the United Okinawan Association was up to the challenge. When the campaign came to a close, Hawaii's Uchinanchu community and their friends had shown their support to the tune of $9 million. According to Kuba, 98% of those who had pledged money to the project made good on their promise. Meanwhile, the Hawaii Okinawa Center was taking shape. Even when it had been just a drawing on paper, Yamasato had wanted to have kawada tile grace the roof of the building. But the cost of the kawada far exceeded the construction budget. So Yamasato resigned himself to using American tile. When I presented a problem about uh, not being able to have the kawara because of cost item, uh, Mr. Takehiro Ishikawa of Marusangyo Company, you know, stood up in this audience and said, uh, you know, they'll come up 
and donate the tile to Hawaii. And this is the tile that we have right now on the building. And that's the so-called the material that really represents uh, Okinawa and uh, gives the feeling of the whole complex being uh, Okinawa Culture Center. But if there was anything more heartwarming than the desire of Hawaii's Uchinanchu to honor their Issei ancestors, it was the desire of the people of Okinawa to support the people who had supported them in their darkest hour. The people that benefited from that through the decades were then at, in the 1980s, 1990s in positions of power and responsibility. They're the ones that remembered what Hawaii did for Okinawa. And what Hawaii did for Okinawa in those several years after the war, Okinawans have spent a lifetime repaying. The first $150,000 from Okinawa came from one of the founders of the UOA, Kameske Nakamura. Gracing the Hawaii Okinawa Center complex are two gardens that complement each other. The Issei Garden, honoring the community's rich past, and the Takakura Garden, symbolizing its present and the future. Both gardens are kept beautifully maintained by a corps of dedicated volunteers, people like retired school principal George Nakasone. Like so many of the center's volunteers, Nakasone says spending time working in the garden is his way of remembering and honoring a generation that sacrificed so much for people like him. Not only my parents, but all the Issei's that I have known throughout my lifetime, Recalling those days when getting together with them, uh, not fully realizing what they have done to contribute to our quality of life. Ironically, the Hawaii Okinawa Center, probably Yamasato's most public and visible project as a practicing architect, was a labor of love, done in the spirit of Yui Nu Kukuru, Uchinanchu's spirit with hearts together. I think because of the effort of the community, and their involvement in the design, you know, we got a structure that everybody's proud of, you know. Not only myself, I, I feel like it's, it belongs to the community and everybody had an input in it. And uh, this is the result of it. On June 16, 1990, a light drizzle fell over the Hawaii Okinawa Center, a Hawaiian blessing for the new home of the United Okinawan Association and Hawaii's Okinawan community. The dream was now a reality. Close to 5,000 people, local Uchinanchu, as well as supporters from Okinawa, came to help open the doors of their new home. The day was made even sweeter by the presence of many Issei, whose struggles and sacrifices were the cornerstone of the beautiful center. Edward Kuba remembers the day. I walked onto the premises, hurrying to get to the grand opening, and I saw the four to 5,000 people that had gathered to attend the facilities. And I finally looked up at the center and said, where did this thing come from? And the, the past four or five years before that, I was just too busy to really appreciate what we we're doing. And then seeing the center for the first time, grand opening, I said, whoa, this is really beautiful. It was worthwhile. The challenge that we had undertaken, we met. For architect Maurice Yamasato, the morning began bittersweet. In 1987, when the center was still a dream, but a dream closer than it had ever been to becoming reality, his father, Toshio Yamasato, had picked out a special Okinawan pine tree out of the hundreds he nurtured at his home on Kauai. This matsu is for the Hawaii Okinawa Center, he told Maurice. Toshio Yamasato never lived to see his special matsu take root at the Hawaii Okinawa Center. The morning of the opening, I just came here by myself about 7 o'clock in the morning and I was looking at the pine, the pine tree and the center and kind of teary-eyed because it looks so beautiful and to think that my dad donated the pine tree. At his father's funeral, the minister had told Maurice that any time he saw a butterfly flying around, it symbolized his dad. All of a sudden there was a butterfly that came fluttering around me, you know that I couldn't help but have tears in my eyes to think that, yeah, Dad's right here, sharing this moment with me. The opening of the Hawaii Okinawa Center did indeed draw in the Okinawan community for cultural and organizational activities. In 1991, Isaac Hokama, 
a sansei whose father had served as the organization's president nearly three decades earlier, became the first UOA president installed at the Hawaii Okinawa Center. Although mortgage-free, the UOA now had a building that would have to be maintained, and that required money. Hokama initiated UOA's first fundraising craft fairs. In 1993, the United Okinawan Association took a giant leap forward with the installation of Jane Serikaku, a public school principal, as its first woman president. I was asked to be uh, to consider being president of the United Okinawan Association, not as the first female president, but just as president of the organization. Serikaku says there was support from all segments of the community. As her year as president progressed, she and her advisors recognized a void among the new Sansei and Yonsei club leaders. The UOA organized several workshops from which eight guiding principles, fundamental beliefs relating to the United Okinawan Association, came forth. We needed to have common beliefs, common understanding, before we could go further. And that became what was guiding us in our plans for the year and subsequent years after that. Fundamental to UOA's future was the strength of its member clubs. If the clubs were strong, so too would the UOA be strong. Also vital to the UOA's future was a need to nurture, trust, and continually involve young people in the organization. Serikaku had witnessed the bounty of the UOA's decision in 1981 to trust in its young. The people who, have, who went on that first tour, the first leadership tour, they came back very, very excited and uh, they looked for things to, that they could contribute. Serikaku decided to reinvent the program. The new leadership study tour represented a partnership between the UOA, the member clubs, and the young prospective leader. The first group that I, t uh, that I took over to Okinawa, um, they became the leaders not only of their own clubs, but of HUOA. And then the next group that I took, they're now very involved. And what we have done was uh, to continue to keep them involved. In 1995, the United Okinawan Association adopted a new name, the Hawaii United Okinawa Association. Veteran KZU radio host Keiko Uda has watched the Hawaii United Okinawa Association blossom over the decades. Now 51 member clubs strong, she says the future rests in good hands. Okinawans have been in Hawaii for over a century now. While the 2000 centennial celebration honored the past, it also marked the passing of the torch to the younger generation, to people like 27-year-old Yonsei, Allison Yanagi. I don't know exactly why I understood that I was Okinawan, but ever since I was a, a, a child, I always knew that I was Okinawan for some reason. And I attribute a lot of that um, knowledge or that, that consciousness to my grandparents, especially my grandmother. Yanagi visited Okinawa for the first time while a student at the University of Hawaii on an exchange program with the University of the Ryukyus. Her month-long visit opened up a new world to her and led to several more and longer periods of study and observation. It was one of the most influential experiences in my entire life because the people that I met there, the experiences that I had, really, um, I guess, just affected me in a way that I never thought I could be affected. Her childhood introduction to Okinawan culture led her decision to study Okinawan dance, which led to sanshin lessons, and then kucho. I became so involved with the performing arts aspect of it that I wanted to know more about just Okinawa in general, the history, the religion, the politics, uh, everything. 
because I knew Okinawa wasn't just Okinawa. Even though Okinawa is just a prefecture of Japan, it's very obvious that Okinawa is not anything like the rest of Japan. And, and I wanted to know what those differences were, why they, why they were there. Yanagi's need to know about Okinawa has led her to pursue Okinawa as a scholarly endeavor at the University of Hawaii, where, much to her disappointment, there was very little for her to choose from. She has returned to the University of Hawaii's Manoa campus, working towards her master's in Asian studies, with an emphasis on Okinawa. Yanagi is hoping to find answers to some of the disparities she finds between what she is learning in the classroom and what she is experiencing in her own life. Things that I learned from them were very different from the things that my grandparents taught me. And because there was such a chasm between what was going on in scholarship and what was going on in my own family, I felt that there was a need to bridge these two sides. In young people like Allison Yanagi, we entrust the future of the Hawaii United Okinawa Association. Last year before I, I left for Okinawa, um, I spent about a week just videotaping my grandmother. And uh, I did it with the intention of saving something for me, but also perhaps leaving something for my own children or my grandchildren to see. And um, even though my grandmother is a Kibe Nisei, in many respects, she's still very Ise because she identifies, I think, probably more with Okinawa than she ever did with the United States. Um, and I want my family to remember that. Um, my grandfather who passed away, you know, I never got the chance to videotape him. But when I was in high school, I wrote one of my papers about him and uh, he told me stories about what it was like to live on the plantation. And I guess the biggest lesson I took from everything that my grandparents told me was that they suffered so much so that I could have everything that I have now. But their happiness is that I'm so successful. And I think I want everybody to realize that if it weren't for all the suffering and all the tribulations that the Issei went through, none of us would be here now. And I think it's, I think it's spectacular how um, successful you know, the, the third and fourth generation Okinawans are. But if it weren't for the Issei instilling in us a certain pride, a tremendous work ethic, this idea of unity. None of us would be where we are. We wouldn't have the Kai Kung, we wouldn't have the HUO way. And I think the one thing I would like people to remember is that Okinawans did it because they were a group. It was a bunch of individuals who worked as a group. It wasn't just one person, it wasn't just a group of people, it was everybody contributing. Wow. wow.
<laughs> Wasn't that a good show? That blew me away, Pat. Yeah. I I I looked at it and said, wow, that, that really happened like 20 years ago, yes. So I, I, I kind of recall it, but I, I I it's all new to me now. <laughs> I'm glad I saw it, you know, that that uh that that feeling of being Uchiranchu came came out at the very beginning when when uh Mr. who was that? Uh oh, I forget. I forget the guy's name already. Mr. Nakamura. Oh, Nakamura, yeah, yeah. yeah, 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 yeah. He, he just said, you know, we all, you, you fella, you know, you talk about, talk about pigeon English, you know, he, he talked about, <laughs> let's, let's work together. And I think that's where, that's, that's where it all began, you know, you got to work together. Otherwise you guys will fight, 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 you know, I don't think what happened. So, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. This is, you know, this is all new to me because I've only been in living in Hawaii since 2006. And so this is, I mean, completely new to me. Oh, yeah, and, yeah, yeah. Um, just wonderful to see, you know, you know, my observation, you know, how I got involved was, uh, you know, when I went very similar to many of the leadership tour members, I went to Okinawa and that's how I got inspired. But then you work with uh, community members uh, involved in HOA and everybody's just so passionate and then gives their all best just to help the organization and the community strive. And so it is great to see that it's been kind of going on, you know, 20 years ago, 30 years ago when the, uh, the Kaikan was built. And, and um, yeah, it's just, just wonderful to see how that uh, story became. So, wow. You, you, you know what? You know what really got to me is that when, when the guy said, you know, we, we, we were, uh, we're trying to pass this on to the third Sunset generation and get, get the new leadership from them. And I'm thinking about, Oh my God, I'm, I'm, I'm Nisei, you know, I, I'm, I'm the older generation and although I'm, I'm a young Nisei, but I still think, wow, I, you know, cause I don't know too many of the new things that you guys know, the computer thing and all that, but so kind of a step back cause I was watching the program. I think, you know, my mom, my mom was, uh, was attended all of those events that, 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 uh, and, and she really appreciated the fact that she could watch the opening of the of the Okinawa Center and uh, wow. she, she she totally enjoyed it yeah yeah you know I, I kind of saw a recurring theme uh, you know that the one um, you know many of the members in, in 1980 you know went to young members went to um, uh, to Okinawa and that's how they got kind of got involved a lot of the sunset started getting involved and then uh, you know, Isaac Hokama mentioned in the 90s that, you know, turning over to the young generation is when mm -hmm. HOA started blossoming. So I keep thinking to myself, you know, I feel like we're still kind of in the same mindset where, you know, we're, we're trying to get the, the young generation involved. Yes. And, we, you know, just uh, sitting in a couple of committees of our even younger than myself, a younger generation than myself, still continuing to help out. Uh, put the programming together for Ide no he and even the, mm -hmm. this upcoming Uchinan Chino he I, I feel like I think we're in good hands. I don't know what you think about that, Pat. No, I I, I think we're in good hands. You know why? You know why? I, I'm, I'm thinking the younger generation, we're getting them involved because because of their knowledge of the computer, mm -hmm. and they do it so fast. I mean, they can type out agendas, they can type out things. They're like, I watched the whole oh, wow. It would take me like two hours just to complete an agenda. They just in you know, a flash. In ten minutes, it's all done already. It's like, but you know, I think, but but because they know how to how to um, do the computer, I think we we need to rely on them because mm -hmm. in the past, a lot of people said, "Hey, we gotta get we gotta get history. We 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 gotta get this place. We gotta get this thing recorded so that people can know." And you know, we're doing it now with Yuntaku Live because which which you and uh, Lynn Lynn involved last year. I, th I think it's a wonderful program that just just evolved and I think, wow, you guys did it just out of the whim because we it was in a COVID pandemic, but it serves its purpose because people from all over the world can watch it. And not only that, it goes on YouTube and it kind of stays there forever. We were watching the beginning of, of uh, new new performing arts groups or uh, performing arts groups coming and they, they're telling their story, how they began. And I think it's a wonderful way of uh, telling people, hey, you want to know history? Go on YouTube and go watch all these programs because, you know, it comes it comes on Channel Fifty Three on a on a, on a regular basis. And uh, although we don't have a set program for it, but I, you know, if you you go to Channel Fifty Three and you kind of surf the channels, you might catch it. And then 
even though you watched it one time, you watch it again, and you learn you learn a few things. And you know that's 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 what I've been doing. So, so for those of you that don't know what to do and you you, you don't want to watch regular TV, go Channel Fifty Three or go surf the internet and go watch go watch all the YouTube programs because you're gonna learn a lot. And if you wanna learn about history, that's the way to do it. And for you younger generation, I I, I totally understand that you guys are like uh, uh, you know getting involved with you know creating website and that's what we need we need we need to have the younger generation come in so you guys can create the website and us old guys can tell you what to do <laughs> hey, you know Pat, i think it's it's also great that you know i think uh you know the younger generation could also use a little nudge and i like how you get uh, uh many of your grandkids involved to be committee members to help put up with some of these uh, so i think you know have some encouragement from the grandparents is always, uh, you know, helpful. Yeah. And, uh, and it's just one way to connect with your, your younger generation, your grandkids, and maybe they can show you how to do some of these, uh, you know, being able to watch on YouTube and so forth. So, wow. I think very much important. Yeah. For those I'm always asking them, them questions. They, hey, hey, how you do this? How you <laughs> man save? How, how, how you do that? You know, they told it to me, yeah. grandpa, just do this. And oh, okay. Okay. <laughs> yeah, man. And, and just this reoccurring theme of, of, you know, young people going to Okinawa on leadership tours, or even even mm -hmm. the Taikai, and how they get just, just their their passion ignites when they visit Okinawa, meet their relatives, see the culture, and come back and wanting to get involved. I feel like that's something that's so important that maybe that's something that we gotta take a look at and and consider maybe doing a leadership tour again. I don't. I feel like we haven't done it in a while, but wow. Well, not only that, not only that, but I think just watching this video, the one the one we, we just mm -hmm. presented tonight. It is a show it, it just tells you how what happened in, in okinawa the battle of okinawa and basically that's how it all started where where uh the united okinawa association was formed because mm -hmm. of the support that they gave to the to their homeland and uh it just created a you know like uh when i was chairman of, of some things i said you know you throw a pebble in the water and you watch the wave just go and mm -hmm. spread out yeah. so you know basically that's what's happening yeah you throw a pebble in the water and the thing just has, has a ripple effect and it just creates a bigger wave and it just, you know, it just goes on and on. So I think that that's, you know, that's how the Okinawa survive. And I think that it's going to continue that way. Pat, you know what works even better than that? You just get a handful of pebbles and throw them all in the pebble yeah. at the same time. <laughs> create a big tidal wave. Yeah, <laughs> big, yeah, big tidal wave. <laughs> and I just want to shout out to Gwen. Uh, what a wonderful... Uh, Alison Yanagi, Yanagi brought me to tears. She was so young, but she knew the value of our Issei and honoring the generation. Very heartwarming. And I feel like she's still very young. I, I, I did all that too, because I, I was mm -hmm. kind of emotional on that part too, because I, I could feel, my, my I could feel, basically I think everybody has a, has their own feeling of, of what their grandparents were like, what their parents were like. Mm -hmm. And so, yeah, it brought out a few um, emotional effects on that. So I could I could see where she was coming from. Thank Tristan. you, Alex. Tristan, thank you for tuning in from Wainai. Carolyn Ozaki from Kakaako. Thank you very much for tuning in. I hope, wow, I, I thought, I, ho I hope you were heartwarmed. Uh, I was, and I hope you learned something new about our Okinawan community and HOA. Uh, although we were watching the 50th anniversary that was viewed, uh, aired in 2001. Uh, we are celebrating seven years of Hawaii United Okinawa Association this year. So, mm -hmm. Man, cheers to another 20 years, 10, 20 years. <laughs> well, we only got five more years, four more years to the 75th. And I think yeah. we should have a real bang up, bang another up. Big, on big that, milestone yeah. anniversary. Yeah, yeah, very excited. Uh, hopefully COVID will, will, will be subsided. We'll have a big celebration. And plus, I think maybe we can do it both ways. Yeah, virtual and, and yeah, big celebration. Yeah, 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 yeah. I think so. That would be perfect. Yeah. Oh, Pat, man. What a, what a show. I thought this was a great way to just kind of remind us of, you know, what, what, what makes uh, our Hawaii Okinawan community. So hope you enjoyed it. I, yeah. I very much so. And it was very, very educational for me. I hope you viewers did as well, too. Yes. I hope all, I hope all of you told your family to watch it because it's an, it's an inspirational thing to watch. And it kind of brings back memories from the past. And uh yeah, so it, it was very very heartwarming to watch. 
Chimugukuru yeah, and then, yeah. Yeah, Chimugukuru Tichi. And then again, you know, if you if you missed it, you know, if you wanted you were trying to let somebody know, again, you just gotta go to YouTube, search HOA or Hawaii Night Okinawa Association. You can watch all the shows. Yes. A uh, hundred plus shows or so. So um enjoy it when you have time and it's a great learning experience. So thank you very much, everybody. Thank Tristan, you, everybody. thank you from Wainai. Uh, my girlfriend says is Okinawan and found her family on the OGSH database after watching a previous Yuntaku episode. That's uh, amazing, yeah. guys! OGS, wow, that's yeah. that's exactly OGSH you know what we're looking to do. Family. So that's wonderful. I thought their membership would increase after that show. Yeah. Absolutely. <laughs> well, thank you very much, guys. Again, Yuntaku Live. We're on uh, every second and fourth Tuesday of the month, so please tune in. Uh, We'll, we'll check you guys out later. Pat, yeah. have a great Thank evening. You. Everybody out there, mm -hmm. great evening. Mahalo. Mahalo, yeah. Benifei debiru. Benifei debiru. And what? Yuta sarugutu, onegeru.